Craig, I'm sorry, it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. Because I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. <laughs> Hello again, I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of the Daily Record, and welcome to another Planet Holyrood. Joining me this week are Anna Burnside, who's the Daily Record's chief writer, and also Ben Borland, who is the editor of the Scottish Daily Express. Um, there's only one story being discussed at Holyrood today, and that is the ongoing saga of Health Secretary Michael Matheson's 11 grand data roaming bill. Um, we just had a personal statement from Mr. Matheson in front of MSPs, which he hopes will help him hold on to his job. Uh, I'm not personally convinced that that's going to happen. Um, what he basically said was that the 11 grand bill that he incurred on a family holiday in Morocco uh, was actually incurred by his kids watching football. Um, and uh, that is the explanation that he's given to members of the Scottish Parliament, um, having previously said that uh, it was only uh, used for parliamentary business. So let, let's start with you, Anna. Were you convinced by his explanations? He obviously got uh, emotional talking about his kids. He was fighting back the tears. Do you think this will be enough to save his bacon? I mean, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's the obvious place to look. If you've been on holiday with two teenagers and you've got an eleven thousand uh, pound data roaming bill, you know, I, I, I would I would argue that that is the logical first place to start looking. Um, so I don't think this is a surprise. I, I don't think this is this kind of come as a surprise to anyone that that this is um, how these charges were accumulated. I mean, he. He made a convincing case today that he, um, how would we say this nicely, uh, blurred, blurred some of the details on this so that to protect his children, that was his argument today of why he had, um, you know, not come clean about how these charges were incurred and how, and, and as soon as he he said today, you know, as soon as he discovered that this was why, so basically he was responsible for these, he was responsible for these charges that, that he and his wife, you know, said, decided instantly that they would pay for them. And whether that is enough to save his job, I, like you, Paul, have my doubts. I mean, I think anyone with teenage children will have immense sympathy. We've all been there. You know, nobody gets through being a parent without having at least one horrendous situation that your kids get you into like this. You know, the definition of, of being young and immature is not realising the consequences of your actions. And this is what the teenage Mathesons have, um, have done with this. But I still don't think the way that he has handled it has been impressive. I think he's made the classic mistake it's, it's the classic scenario. The story is old as time. It, the the cover-up is worse than the crime. You know, he has made this a hundred times worse by obfuscating, even if for the best possible reasons, i.e. to protect his children, he has made his situation much, much worse. And given Douglas Ross and indeed Jackie Bailey, who also had a good go at him today, you know, a lot of material to work with by not coming clean on this straight away. So I too think he is uh, headed for the door. Ben, just to pick up on a point that Anna made there, um, you know, the, the Parliament first investigated this back in January. And that's when they alerted him to this £11,000 data roaming bill. And he said to MSPs that they couldn't work out where it had come from. But surely at that point, given that he knew he'd been on a family holiday, he should have been asking his kids and his wife, did you use the iPad? <clears throat> Absolutely. I think there was um, there was one interesting point in, uh, well, there's lots of interesting points, but there's one point he raised where he said that he was aware that his sons, I think it's three sons he's got, um, he was aware that his sons had set up a hotspot to his parliamentary iPad. And that was how they were able to get past the um, 
the 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 password protected. So so he didn't admit to giving them the password, but he said we have set up a hotspot, and he said my sons helped me set up the hotspot. Now my kids have a hotspot to my uh, private phone that I pay for, and quite often on long car journeys they'll suck up all the data um, via my hotspot. Now there's a couple of things here, and anyone who's got a hotspot will know this. First. Every time someone wants to access your device and use your data via a hotspot, you have to approve it. So just saying, oh, they had access via the hotspot, therefore he he would have had to click approve to to allow them to use the hotspot. Uh, the, The other thing is he's admitted that the kids are using his parliamentary iPad as as a hotspot device. Yeah, that's, I mean, he admitted that in in, in the statement. So, so is therefore, there's questions then? immediately. Is that what he admitted? Did he not say that um, he was because he had? I mean, God, it, it was again. It was this classic of making it really boring, wasn't it? I mean, I nearly no, fell asleep when no, he was no, talking no, about it, SIM cards. But, but wasn't he saying that he was having difficulty with his phone, his work phone? So they set up a hotspot using the iPad. I, I thought that was for him to use. Did I pick that yeah. up wrongly? Was that for him to use? I thought that was, he said the kids had a hotspot. Uh, I thought, was, I just thought he said that the kids, the kids had in classic parent fashion, why else do you have children? That the, 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 the teenagers had, had set that up. I took that as for him to use because he was having difficulty using his phone. I thought that did, is that what you took oh, from that? Okay, that is what I'm talking. About. Yeah, I mean that might be the case, which which I guess takes us back to the question of how did the kids get onto his data contract? Well, and if they'd helped him set it up, there's no reason they then couldn't have. You know, if he's if he's so uh, clueless with his devices that he needs them to help him set up a hotspot, you know, it, it, they then had all you know. What else did they set up while they were doing that? I suppose that's the question. The other thing that came to me out of that was like, he must have known. Surely they talked about the football games if they'd been watching it. I mean, you know, you don't, you're on holiday. What else are you going to be talking about? I mean, yeah. either what, what was what was he doing while they were watching these what, things? And if not, you know, did they not talk about it afterwards? If you're, what, what, if you're, where are the boys this afternoon? Oh, I, I think they're watching exactly. Celtic on their phones. Oh, oh. exactly. I, I don't see how on a holiday. How, uh, that you kind of miss what what each other is doing. Um, I thought that was a bit of a hole in the a, a hole in the story as well. And if they watched it, how how you know that immediately raises um, that question. For for, for me, I, I think there's two things here. Either Michael Matheson is incredibly naive and almost unfit for office because an 11 grand bill's come in, <laughs> the data roaming. He's known that his kids have, presumably he's known his kids have been watching football while on holiday, and yet he's unable to put to, to make that connection, which, which to me, you know, puts his, you know, his level of sort of deductive abilities. He's hardly <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, is he? If, if he's unable to work out that that's how come this bill's so big. The, the alternative, and I don't want to consider this alternative because it, it's it's almost beyond the pale. The alternative is that he's known all along and he's actually now using his children to save his political career. That, that's sure. the alternative here. And it's, it's too awful to contemplate. I know yes. he was upset and, you know, as any parent would be when, when the, the, the children are dragged into the political arena... Uh, th- those are the only two explanations. Either he's so naive that he didn't realise this, or, and, and you know, this would be awful if it was true, he's actually using his own children to save his career after putting in a false uh, against his claim. It's hard to think of uh, an episode or an incident that's been more badly mishandled than this. I mean, you go right back to... Um, being on holiday and not asking the kids, who are you able to watch this football match? Two, to the two football Rangers. matches, two, two Celtic football matches. and Celtic Rangers. Yeah, so watching those football matches, 
and then liaising with the parliamentary authorities and being remarkably incurious. And then the way he handled it after it broke last week, keeping Stum when he realised last Thursday that it had been uh, his teenage kids. It's probably a textbook example of how not to handle a political story. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, that's the point I was making earlier about the actual handling of it actually being a worse crime than the crime itself. If he'd put his hands up to this, everyone who's a parent has been there. I mean, people would have sympathised, or actually people would have sympathised with him. I personally would have sympathised with him because we have 100% all been there. Um, it's the it's the subsequent, um, you know, shadiness and... The drip, ducking, drip. Ducking and diving is really, really unattractive. It's a very, very bad look, especially given what his ministerial brief is and the woeful state that our NHS is in. I mean, I thought Jackie Bailey uh, made that point very well in the questions after his ministerial statement, just pulling out a few key figures of, you know, what he should be focusing on rather than, you know, a, an 11 month old iPads bill and that that just is one of the things that leaves a very bad taste in the mouth about this. Um, just very quickly to both of you, he's referred himself to the Parliament's governing body. Do you think he'll survive? Nah, don't nope. see it. Nope. I mean, the, the, the other thing, you know, going back to obviously it's been handled badly, but the, the mistake here was made in January. In January, he's given a written assurance that that iPad was only used for parliamentary yeah. business. He That's the smoking gun, isn't it? That. That, that, that statement was not correct. He cannot yeah. have known that that... How can he give... Yeah, that? well, he's clearly not done for sort of checks. I mean, he's just, he's just basically provided assurances based on nothing. I think yeah. that's... And I think the, the what kind of... The overarching thing that also makes this a bad... Look, I mean, these are all the kind of micro details, but the macro, the kind of macro picture, if you like, is that he thought that he could get away with this. And that's what happens when you've been in power for a long time and you think you're kind of above scrutiny. And he, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't, in some ways for a political story, it doesn't sound like a lot of money because we're used to dealing with these enormous figures that, you know, the ferry disasters cost and all that kind of thing are huge you know, funny money figures. But I mean, £11,000 on a personal basis is a lot of money. And he just thought he could just just kind of hide that in his expenses and that would be fine. And that's that's what happens when you've been in government for a long time and, and you think that, that that's how you can behave. And that's I think that's another reason that it's an exceptionally bad look. Um, OK, let's just move on. Then, <laughs> I suspect we'll be talking about this one next week. Um, you know, my view is that he'll be health secretary tomorrow, but this time next week, it's, it's uh, certainly up in the air. Do, do, do you know what? And just again, and you've got to take that, take him at his word at the moment. He's not, he's not going to be health secretary for much longer. Let's face it, but he's going to be father to those three boys for the rest of his life. And I just hope that he's not done something today that's going to ruin that reputation. And, and that relationship with his own kids by blaming them for his error, because... Yeah, I think, I think we have to take what he's saying at face value. I mean, I, you know, um, I, I think that uh, what, what he said in his statement, it sounded pretty heartfelt. Um, but look, I, I, unless we have more information... Oh, absolutely. Like, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, I hope it's not the case. I really do. Um, okay, let's look at Westminster and uh, the car crash that happened earlier this week. Um, Rishi Sunak was widely tipped to sack Suella Braverman as Home Secretary. He duly did. That triggered a reshuffle. And then in what was a pretty breathtaking moment in British politics, he brought back former Prime Minister David Cameron and made him Foreign Secretary. Um, now... Anna, just starting with you, when I was at uh, a previous newspaper, I, I wrote a piece describing David Cameron as one of the worst prime ministers in British history. And the reason I, I wrote that is that I think that every prime minister should be judged on what they want to achieve, 
versus what they actually achieve in the end. And David Cameron didn't want the United Kingdom um, out of the European Union. Uh, he was very much of the opposite view, yet Brexit happened on his watch. He was too weak to stop a referendum and he got the outcome that, uh, that he um, passionately did not want to occur. So I, I think on that basis, I, I thought he was a, a terrible PM. Um, what's your view? Do you think that um, people will be cheering on the streets for the, the return of this posh boy? Uh, no, I think people are picking their jaws back up off the streets at the return of him. I mean, nobody saw this coming. Um, I love the the clip that's been doing the rounds of the first of the first journalist, you know, in the pack outside number ten, the first journalist to spot David Cameron um, and, and his wee face. Uh, that's very enjoyable if you enjoy that um, kind of thing. I, I think. I mean, my my takeaway of this <laughs> is that it makes that it really, really makes Sunak look very weak. You know, really, is there nobody within the three hundred and fifty Conservative MPs currently elected who've currently, um, you know, won a seat that that's up that's good enough to take one of the great offices of state is he really so devoid of talent or has burned you know the, the you know as everybody everybody else who could possibly do the job so tainted with a more recent the taint of a more recent prime minister that he has to you know look into the back catalog and and drag david cameron out of his shepherd's hut i think it's a an extraordinary move um I see he's already he's already off on his travels um, and and away in Ukraine uh, pressing the flesh uh, that was quick. Um, I mean, obviously, as a kind of politics nerd, I, I'm kind of fascinated by it, but I, I I can't say that I think it's a that that I think inviting the the person who is responsible for the single biggest um, foreign policy disaster, i.e. leaving the EU in, in living memory, <laughs> is a great idea. Ben, what's the Express's take on the sacking of uh, Suella and the re-emergence of um, David Cameron? The Express's take or my take? Um, Actually, yeah, forget about the Express's take. Let's have your take. What's your yeah. take? Well, I think I think the Express. I mean, obviously, we're, we're the Scottish Daily Express. We focus largely on Scottish politics. Um, the Express. My colleagues in London have been of the view that this is, <laughs> <laughs> gently put. I like that. Please, this continue. is um, this is diplomacy. Diplomacy. I, I think that I think that you know that they're they're looking at what will. Tory voters in red wall seats think, and they'll think we, we've been stabbed in the back. Like you say, there's a there's there's this posh boy coming back in. Um, the you know, lots of people in the Conservative Party are unhappy about the way Suella was was sacked. Um, lots of people think she speaks to. Uh, you know, a, a sizable constituency in, in particularly in England. Um, so, but my, my view is slightly different. I, I think it's a good move. I think it's now whether it's by accident or by design, because he's tried a few different um, resets in recent months. I think this is the best one yet. I think taking the Tories back towards the centre ground is a very, very smart move because Keir Starmer's Labour seem to have it all to themselves. So th th this is a smart move. You could probably write off the red wall. I think a lot of those, I mean, it's it, my sort of home turf, if you like. I think a lot of those Northern English seats are going to go back to Labour, no matter what you do. Um, the Tories so, yeah, need, to, what, need to hold on to middle. Sort of, what, what sort of voter do you think this will appeal to then? I think this will appeal to traditional Tory voters in the home counties, people who perhaps don't like the kind of more extreme policies that the Tories have, have pursued in recent years. It's back to that, the old fashioned kind of Ruth Davidson, David Cameron, one nation conservatism. 
And moving, I think it's really, really smart to move the Tories back into the centre ground and try and push Labour left because Keir Starmer has been allowed to just hog that middle lane. And if, if the Tories move back in, he's going to have to say, well, look, I, I, he's either going to have to agree, agree with the Tories on some things or he's going to have to move left. And yeah, man, do you in think the is election, chance, that, that's not where you want to be on the left? Is there a chance, Ben, that the Tories might split or the right wing might split? There might, yeah. The, 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 I think there could be. I think you could see a new, you know, a new harder right party. I, I think, though, if, if you want to win a general election, probably the centre lane is where you want to be. And mm. belatedly, I think Rishi Sunak realised that and that's where he's heading. But do you think that Cameron can do that from the role as foreign secretary? You know, I mean, it d doesn't everything, every poll ever say that, you know, for, foreign affairs are the last thing that people make a decision on I, when they're voting? Or do you just think it's his presence? In the I think it's just his presence, absolutely, yeah. Just It's just the signal that, look, we're heading back yeah. towards the Tory party of 2010 to 2015, which personally, and I'm not saying this is what the Express think, Personally, I think that's a good move. I was going to mention Rwanda, but let's just focus on the, the, the votes yesterday on the conflict in the Middle East and the problems that have been caused for, for Labour, Anna. Um, I think there was an opinion poll this week that showed Labour about 30 points ahead, and maybe another one showing them 27 ahead. Do you think that the resignations from the front bench as a result of Labour's stance in a ceasefire, will that, will that damage Starmer or do you think it will embolden him? We'll see previous comments about about um, foreign policy. I don't think it massively affects people, how people vote at all. I think it's very easy um, if you're interested in politics and on Twitter, I won't. I refuse to think of it as X, you know, if you're engaged in that kind of world, I think this feels like the, the huge defining issue of the moment and it's a, I'm not in any way saying that it's not a hugely important and defining issue but I don't think it it massively is going to affect how people vote mm. and I think it's it's the absolutely the hugest thing for a tiny minority a tiny vocal minority of people and it absolutely isn't for everyone else and I have to say that I think um Labour front benchers resigning on this is really tiresome student union-y politics. They are making the, the Labour Party are in opposition. You know, what they say or think about the situation in Gaza, the, the only material important thing that it may have ever is when Labour are next to the government is how they then have a relationship with these countries when they're in power and they're leading, you know, ha have a, an actual voice in foreign affairs. At the moment, they have no voice in foreign affairs whatsoever. The only good this is doing is the these MPs are, you know, going back to their student politics roots and making speeches and making a big stand about something that they have absolutely no control or input into and they're basically making trouble um, for the Labour Party, creating a diversion when the Labour Party should be focusing on the bread and butter issues that are going to get them into Downing Street. I kind of agree. Whatever your view is, Anna, on the situation in the Middle East, I don't think it's going to in any way determine the next election. No, I absolutely don't. And I just find it tiresome kind of grandstandy behaviour from people, you know, for, from the Labour front benches. It's their equivalent of making pronouncements on Instagram. It achieves absolutely, it makes them feel good. You know, the 1% the of their constituents who are also in that world will be lapping it up. And for the rest of people, you know, they're worried about how much a loaf of bread costs and whether or not they can afford to pay their rent, you know, I think. Ben, it does, you, men, you mentioned Starmer earlier. It does look like he's heading for Downing Street, doesn't it? Unless something monumental happens. 
Yeah, well, uh, j- just on, on the on the vote last night, it's a shame that um, the excellent Dame Jackie Bailey's comments on GMS weren't forwarded around the, the Labour group because she nailed it. The, the SNP amendment was nothing to do with uh, ceasefire. It was nothing to do with the war between Israel and Hamas. It was all to do with setting a trap for Labour and they walked right into it. Just, there you go. Jackie uh, Bailey and- pointed it out. She said, this is plain politics. Yeah. They are setting a trap to divide the Labour Party. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the, the English Labour MPs fell for it. It's yeah. probably the smartest bit of politics that the SNP have done on, on Humsey Yusuf's watch. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah absolutely. I mean, they, they don't have much leverage at Westminster and they used it pretty effectively last night, as far as I can see. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, good week, bad week. Ben, let's start with you. OK, uh, good week. Slightly, uh, possibly controversial choice. Uh, James Cleverly. Um, mm. I thought um, he, he, he's... You know, he's clearly a rising star in the party. He's he's obviously got a big promotion, difficult job. He's, he's got to somehow get a, a Rwanda flight to take off before the general election or uh, or, or Rishi Sunak's in trouble. But, you know, he's, he's, he's spoken well. I think there was generally quite a good um, uh, review of his, his, his uh, debut as Home Secretary yesterday. I think someone said he's got a kind of blokish rugby club way about him, and um, yeah, I, I, I kind of like him. I thought he got he did quite well today at the the police conference, which obviously we've seen uh, home secretaries get a very rough ride there. Maybe it was because it's only his second day, but he he, he seemed to go over quite well. So uh, James Cleverly has had a good week. Um, yeah. Bad week. Um, this was chosen before 2 p.m., but uh, it was already apparent. Uh, Michael Matheson's had an awful week. Um, again, you know, he got he got very emotional during that statement. Um, and you know, has 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 he done enough to to save save his his ministerial career and and prove that he didn't know um, how the charges had been accrued? I, I don't think. Don't think he has. I think he's he's obviously had a difficult week, both in the public eye and out of the public eye. So let's let's leave it there. Anna, over to you. Okay, good week. I've picked Stephen Flynn, who was then named the the hardest um, MP in Westminster. This was a, a fascinating, if totally unscientific, poll of SPADs and kind of Westminster journalists and insiders, uh, which made fascinating reading. And uh, interestingly, I think most of the people polled were English. And I had never previously particularly uh, got hard man vibes off Stephen Flynn, but obviously everybody else, all these people had, and he was voted the hardest guy in Westminster. And uh, yeah, and and, uh, there's a thug life um, memes doing the rounds on Twitter. So uh, I thought that was probably pretty much a win for him, given that I can't, you know, he doesn't have massive cut through with outside Scotland and so on. I thought he would probably take that as an absolute win. All hail I, Scottish politics, big bait. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, who, who doesn't want to, who doesn't want to inspire that level of terror in the, I know, you know, watch TV, watch TV, you know the, an award for the tamest MSP. It's well, exactly. Who wants to be the big girl's blouse of the back benches? That's, <laughs> that's not a, a, an accolade anyone's going for, is it? Um, and I think, well, bad week again, a slightly obvious choice, but I just think Rishi Sunak just emerges from, from this week looking really weak. I think the choice of Cameron just shows that you, you've run out of talent and ideas that the talent puddle you know that you're that you're left to draw from is empty and I also think with Suella Braverman has you know what the things she's re- revealed about their their arrangement and how she switched to backing him um the the policy promises that he made and so on. I think that also makes him look really, really weak and shady. That he would agree to a whole lot of stuff about small boats in Rwanda and so on. But he's really, 
in, in no position to guarantee that he can carry out. You know, he wrote a lot of checks that he can't really honour um, to secure her support. And I think that is a very bad look and, and just makes him look really weak. So he, a, an unimpressive politician has emerged from this week looking even less impressive, I think. Yeah, my money's on Rishi working for Elon Musk after the next. Well, Jim he's Ryan. made that quite obvious, hasn't he? I mean, that that was him. That was him on on the basically the the MP's milk crown, isn't it? That all the stuff he was doing, interviewing him live and so on. You know, that was a that was a, a you it's know a job a, interview. A it wasn't, it wasn't yeah, like a, absolutely. A live. It was a live CV. <laughs> right, that's great. Better wrap it up. Um, Thank you again to Ben and to Anna for your wonderful insights. Hope you join us next week for the latest with iPad Gate and uh, whatever WhatsApp messages scandal Hamza Yusuf serves up. So thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you again soon. Think I'm sorry, it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.